For we have not, by following artificial fables, mythos, made known to you the power and presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his greatness. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, this voice coming down to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. St. Paul says to St. Timothy, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding the profane novelties of words and oppositions of knowledge falsely so called. Thank you, St. Peter and St. Paul. Let us begin this second conference by repeating our previous disclaimer. Namely, that I am not here to pass judgments on the person of J.R.R. Tolkien. From all accounts, he was a devout Catholic. But all of us can pass judgment on his works and their effects and their fruits. This, I think, we have done in our previous conference to a satisfactory degree using sound doctrine, even though many more points could be discussed, and we will take up a few uh, again in this second conference. What remains is to ask why. Why did he write these stories? Why did he try to baptize myth? Something that had not been done successfully for nearly two millennia. How did Tolkien, a devout Catholic, end up writing this way? Was it just to write stories for his children? Why did Dr. Kordelarczyk do what he did? Why did Louis de Waal fall into his error on astrology? Why did Dr. Wolfgang Smith not have too much hesitation at looking at Jacob Bain? The answer to these is what I'm trying to do now. How is it that these good men fell into these pitfalls? Joseph Pierce claims that the Tolkien myth is profoundly Christian, a theological thriller. In one of his letters, Tolkien wrote, The Lord of the Rings is fundamentally religious, and Catholic work. Unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, why did he have to consciously revise his work to be Catholic? This is a most strange way of approaching the truths of God. It is a statement that he did not set out to make his work Catholic to begin with. But it was a second thought. I think it's here that he inserted that March 25th date. Now, before we attempt to answer why he wrote this way, I would like to address a problem that is very much present in the membership of the Holy Church today, namely that of looking only at what is good in things while ignoring the evil or the error. Traditionally, the church not only points out what is true and good, but also what is false, what is erroneous, and what is evil, what is to be avoided. In dealing with the outbreak of the revolution that is still with us today, the revolution that really began with the Renaissance, the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent repeated itself a number of times in this regard, saying it was convened for the extirpation of heresies, and the reform of morals to draw unbelievers to the faith, to overcome heretics, and to confirm the faithful. Those are the reasons they gathered. Not just to confirm the faithful, not just to point out what is good and true, but to point out what is wrong, what is hurtful to good morals. Now, on the other hand, the New Agers of our time, children of the Revolution, tend to look only for the positive in all religions in order to pick and choose what they like, not bothering with the rest. Seeking higher planes of knowledge and consciousness, thinking that all religions, as it were, somehow tap in to this higher consciousness. Thus, they will praise our Lord and King Jesus Christ for some of his sayings while passing over that 
those that mention hell sin and require conversion of heart that require chastity. Madame Helena Bladovatsky strove to do just this, even to form an occult group called the Theosophical Society to study and compare religions, philosophy, and science. By the way, she was the one who brought back the works of Meister Eckhart. Thus, it is a kind of New Age mentality to examine works of men like Tolkien and Lewis, highlighting what is perceived as true and good while passing over what is erroneous. Now consider for a moment Plato's allegory of the cave, which is found in his work, The Republic. In this allegory, there are some people in a cave, and they're chained from childhood in a fixed position, such that they could not leave or move around much. All they could see was a sort of screen upon which shadows were cast of things passing by due to the light of a fire that was hidden from the viewers. The people casting the shadows were carrying all kinds of things to and fro, such that they projected many different sorts of images. These same people also talked and carried on conversations as they passed by, while the viewers heard only echoes bouncing off the walls. Seemingly, these echoes were giving life to the shadows, or giving them voices. Using their reason, the chained observers discussed these things, trying to figure out what it all meant. They named the figures and developed elaborate ideas concerning them, and theories were produced. At some point, however, one of these observers was released and shown what was really happening. He was then taken from the cave into the outside world into the open air and the sunlight. He saw many things clearly and realized how wrong his previous ideas had been. Going back into the cave, he tried and tried to convince his fellow prisoners like a missionary what was really true. <laughs> that they were only seeing shadows. They all rejected the truth of which he was trying to convince them. They ridiculed him and even wanted to put him to death. Now this allegory easily applies to our times. As Catholics, we have the fullness of the faith, meaning that we have the benefit of being outside the cave, in the open sunlight, of God's revelation. Furthermore, we are not chained to worldly ways of thinking as are others. We have the ability to look at the world using our faith under the guidance of the church's teaching along with her fathers and doctors. Do we appreciate this great supernatural gift we have? Let's use it. But on the other hand, those of the world unwilling to embrace God's revelation become very attached or chained to their own limited theories and ideas. Being locked into this world suffering from the effects of original sin, which includes things like obstinacy and darkening of the intellect, they cannot help themselves in presenting everything they think and theorize about as being true when in reality they only have little bits of information to go from, and it's a very skewed perspective. Let us not be numbered among these people. Furthermore, as I have said, a sort of disease is present among us today, having no more active index of forbidden books, having put aside the penalties of the church, Ignoring the rather sobering prophecies of Fatima and other saints and approved seers of old, and with our last major council being a pastoral council, the leaders of the church have become afraid to point out the errors in writings and in works of our time. For fear of sounding too negative, for of sounding like the Church of the Council of Trent rather than the Church of Vatican II. 
Thus, the tendency now is to focus only on what is true and good and positive. This is not traditional. This is not authentic Catholicism. This is not safe. In fact, one could argue that it is New Age thinking making headway into the church. What I'm doing here may even seem mean-spirited. Mean-spirited, lacking in charity, ruining the fun of a lot of Catholics and so on. But that is just not true. What we're doing here is what good Catholics have always done. In regard to fantasy, literature, and myths, we must come out of the cave. We need to let go of our emotional attachments to such works and judge them in God's light. The light of the deposit of the faith. The light of doctrine. Although we may like sitting down in the cave, although we may find things being proposed there by seemingly enlightened teachers as interesting and fascinating to consider and captivating. When we see the reality, however, we must reject those ideas and free ourselves from them if they are contrary to God's law, contrary to God's revelation, contrary to sound doctrine lest they taint our thinking and, worse still, damage our faith. These stories are exciting, yes, and that makes them pleasurable. But at the same time, pleasure blunts our judgment, making it more difficult to accept these things as dangerous. Thus, not surprisingly, in the allegory of the cave, the chained observers rejected both the message and the messenger because he touched on the one thing they found pleasurable. Even though he had been among them at one time. May we not imitate their mistake. All this applies directly to how Mr. Joseph Pierce presents the Lord of the Rings as being profoundly Christian myth and a theological thriller while passing over the difficult points I've already presented, and there are more. For example, nothing is said of the strange and condemned Gnostic doctrine that has been woven into Tolkien's creation story. Furthermore, Pierce presents a concept called applicability, whereby myth becomes relevant while still remaining a myth and yet not a gal allegory. Thus, the staff of Gandalf can be the rod of Moses at times, which by way of typology, according to the fathers of the church, is the cross of Christ. And this is why Moses almost always used it with arms outstretched. And that's why it was made of wood. But when we see the staff of Gandalf shattered before the Balrog, it is no longer applicable as the staff of Moses. Because why? Because the cross remains firm. It does not break. It is never to be moved. The staff of Moses was never broken, but was placed inside the ark. This alone shows that this notion of applicability is nothing but a recipe for relativism, subjectivism, with each person determining what is or is not applicable to him. Objectivity is lost. This is just how New Agers behave, taking what they find applicable to their life today and not worrying about the rest. And surely, this is precisely one of the main reasons Tolkien's works are so popular at this time. They fit in with today's relativistic thinking. Everyone can read these works and make of the symbolism what they want, while rejecting the rest without any remorse. After all, it's only a fantasy. It's just a myth. 
And we're free to make of it what we like. It is an established fact that George Lucas, the famous George Lucas, the producer of Star Wars, is a New Ager. That is, someone who followed occult spirituality and is looking for the New Age to come. In his movie Willow, for example, the main actor had to learn that the power to perform magic resided in himself. In his own hands and fingers, as it were. It's a clear sign of the new age. You're a god. You just need to discover it. Although Lucas was born and raised in a Methodist family, the religious and mythical themes in Star Wars were inspired by his interest in the writings of a mythologist, a philosopher of mythology named Joseph Campbell. As a result, Lucas would eventually come to identify strongly with Eastern religious philosophies he studied and incorporated into his films. Which philosophies were a major inspiration for the Force? Eventually, Lucas identified his religion as Buddhist Methodist. In other words, he was picking and choosing what he liked. Yet, how many well-intentioned Catholics will watch the Star Wars trilogy and see all sorts of good things, even defending the series as being good and promoting virtue? As noted, Lucas relied on Joseph Campbell, who died in 1987, for his own understanding of myth. Campbell was a new ager, someone operating under occult concepts. Now let us pause here to see if his teaching does not coincide almost exactly with what many like Joseph Pierce are teaching about Tolkien. I'm not making any claim that Mr. Pierce, who I believe is good-hearted and good-willed, you can tell from his presentations that he is. I'm not making any claim that he's a New Ager. I'm making the claim that he too has drank the Kool-Aid of this modern age and is confused. For Joseph Campbell, mythology has a fourfold function within human society. Number one, the metaphysical function, which awakens a sense of awe before the mystery of being. Hmm. According to Campbell, the absolute mystery of life, what he called transcendent reality, cannot be captured directly in words or images. Symbols and mythic metaphors, on the other hand, point outside themselves and into that reality. Quote, Mythical symbols touch and exhilarate centers of life beyond the reach of reason and coercion. The first function of mythology is to reconcile waking consciousness to the mysterium tremendum et fascinans of this universe as it is. End quote. Sound familiar? What did Joseph Pierce say about Tolkien and why he chose the avenue of myth? as a preferred literary form? Quote, For Tolkien, myth was the only way that certain transcendent truths could be expressed in intelligible form. End quote. They are almost identical. Second part, Joseph Campbell. Second reason, the cosmological function, which explains the shape of the universe. Does this sound familiar? Tolkien did this in a Silmarillion. Third function, the sociological function, which validates and supports the existing social order. Although Joseph Pierce points out that the Tolkien myth was about an idealized England under the rule of a king, the reader nevertheless may read into Tolkien's works the evils of Nazism and communism very easily, as well as matters touching on ecology and over-industrialization of our times. Sociological function, very present, very present in the Lord of the Rings. Number four, the pedagogical function. Guides the individual through the stages of life, serving as a guide, ethics, virtue, 
Mr. Pierce goes on for some time about the virtues on display in The Hobbit as well as The Lord of the Rings. They are almost identical, the views of these two men. Campbell also believed that if myths are to fulfill their vital functions in our modern world, they must continually transform and evolve because the older mythologies, untransformed, simply do not address the realities of contemporary life. Particularly with regard to the changing cosmological and sociological realities of each new era. In this, we see once again how dangerous is the use of myth. It is mush. It serves to support the current ways of thinking, evolution, Big Bang cosmology, progress, a concern for the ecology. No wonder these stories just keep resurfacing in new ways. It is clear to me that Tolkien is hardly distinguishable from Campbell. Yet there is much more. If we take a close look at history, at the history of the revolution we are currently feeling so keenly, we know it began with some strength in the 1300s when the leaders of Christendom started to reject scholasticism and Aristotle and turn back to the pagan writings of the Greeks and the Romans, focusing on Plato especially. Unfortunately, this movement has been mislabeled as a renaissance, a rebirth. G.K. Chesterton rightly says it was a death, not a birth. With the renaissance, all the wisdom of the high Middle Ages was pushed back and even rejected. And soon the world, the flesh and the devil started to make a return to the pagan writings of old that had been worked over and rejected by the fathers and the doctors. As a result of the Renaissance, man became more and more the focus of attention with God being more and more forgotten. Go to your local art museum, big metropolitan art museum. When you walk through it, you'll see in picture form, in paintings, the development of the Renaissance. You'll see that God starts going further and further into the background and disappears and man comes forth. The flesh comes forth. More and more immodesty. More and more worldly pictures. Scenery pictures. And pretty soon God is all but forgotten. And that's what we see is going on here with the Renaissance. It's present in every Metropolitan Museum of Art. Not surprisingly, the occult began to manifest itself at the same time. By the middle of the 15th century, Pope Innocent VIII wrote a papal bull to address the problem of witches, and of all places, especially in Germany, for Germany. What was going to happen in Germany a little later? The outbreak of Protestantism. At the same time, supported by this pope, the Dominicans put together one of the most thorough teachings regarding the occult called Maleus Maleficarum, the hammer of witches. What is more, many possessions were dealt with in the 16th and 17th centuries, including some of the most famous in history, such as Sister Magdalena of the Cross, who died in 1560. After making a pact with the devil as a, as a child, she received visions, levitated, had stigmata, and experienced many other extraordinary phenomena. She fooled everyone. At the same time, we also have people like the Lutheran Jacob Beam, special visions of the universe that are erroneous, that are evolutionary in nature. In the early 17th century, there were times when even entire convents were infested with many nuns becoming possessed. By the middle of the 19th century, the occult entered a time of revival and almost complete acceptance, most notably after Napoleon went to Egypt. 
A little later on, the French seminarian Alphonse Louis apostatized from the Saint-Sulpice Seminary in Paris in the 1840s to become an occultist, converting his name Alphonse to Eliphaz and Louis to Levi. Eliphaz Levi. He researched the occult in great depth and detail, gathering all he could find into several volumes that went through multiple printings. These volumes were greatly studied by, and used by people like Madame Helena Blodovatsky and Aleister Crowley and those like them. They were their reference works. As a result, the occult became popular and entered into the modern culture. Rock and roll has heavily depended on the occult sources for its success. At the same time Eliphaz Levi was writing, there were many other manifestations of the occult taking place in America. For example, Andrew Jackson Davis, also known as the Poughkeepsie Seer, often fell into fits of ecstasy and spoke of planets and life on other worlds. He was only 21, folks. He also saw how the universe began with an explosion, in other words, with a big bang, 70 years before Father Lemaitre proposed this as a possibility. Edgar Allan Poe was there to record many of Davis's false visions and he would use them in his own strange works. He also, Edgar Allan Poe wrote his own work called Eureka in which he gave forth a cosmology which was later studied by many astronomers. Once again, it talked about the Big Bang. Arthur Eddington defended the work. One of the most famous astronomers of the 20th century. Davis dictated several volumes, among them Principles of Nature, wherein he set forth a creation myth. Quote, In the beginning, the universe was one boundless, undefinable, and unimaginable ocean of liquid fire. End quote. He went on to describe the making of the great universe and all its spiritual dimensions, of which life on earth was just one. Fire. He liked fire. The world began with fire. That's totally opposite of how God created this world. It says that everything came from water in the book of Genesis. Interesting. Who knows about fire? Who knows about liquid fire? Who knows about oceans of fire? The devil. That's where he lives. By the way, Tolkien has a secret fire being placed at the heart of his universe. And it shows up all over. It shows up on because Gandalf's ring taps into the secret fire. There's fiery letters on the one ring. And the letters are revealed through fire. And the ring is destroyed only in the fires of Mount Doom where it was forged. It was not long before books like Frank Baum's The Wizard of Oz hit the presses and became a great success. This, by the way, is one of the places where the public is programmed that there is good magic and bad magic, good witches and bad witches. Those witches of the East and West, they're wicked. The witches of the North and South, they're good. Soon there was an explosion of this sort of writing and thinking that seemed to reach its peak in the 1960s at the onset of the drug culture. I have only presented snippets of this long history in an attempt to show that Tolkien's writing, sad to say, sad to say, fit in well with this whole stream of thought. This occult-leaning spirituality and this explains why he was its most popular author by the 1960s. Tolkien himself publicly stated to the Daily Telegraph magazine that what he really wanted to do was create a new version of the Atlantis myth. Atlantis. 
In referring to the incredible popularity of Tolkien's works in the 1960s, the manager of the college bookstore at Berkeley, California, seems to have put his finger on it when he said that this was more than a campus fad. It's like a drug dream. Some of the remarks readers made sounded like those coming from LSD trips. Once you've read it, you have something in common with others who've read it. One wonders if Tolkien would have been so successful without LSD being so popular. Like Louis DeWall, like Dr. Wolfgang Smith, and like Dr. Kotelarczyk, what we see here is a good man looking in the wrong places and getting taken in by the swift and alluring current of the revolution. Can we not see why these are dangerous times? The occult has never had such power as it does today. It is so insidious that most today fail to recognize it, even very intelligent Catholics. How right was a Carmelite blessed in saying the devil is like the wind. He can get in through the tiniest cracks. To see this in yet another way. Consider the basic theme of the Renaissance is that the humanistic, naturalistic, pagan works of ancient times led man out of the trouble in which he had found himself in the 13th century. This backward sort of thinking is mirrored in the works of Tolkien. Some examples. How did Bilbo escape from the goblin caves under the Misty Mountains? He was led out by the miscreant Gollum who was planning on eating him. How did Gandalf make it out of the deep pit into which he and the Balrog fell in the mines of Moria? The Balrog led him out. Otherwise, he openly admits he would not have known how to escape. What happens at the climax of the Lord of the Rings when Frodo makes it to Mount Doom to destroy the ring? He cannot do it. He is completely mastered by the ring. Only the evil character Gollum seems able to help him finish the job. So much for Frodo being a Christ figure. Instead of overcoming evil, he himself is mastered by it and is only saved from total failure by an evil creature's intervention. These recurring themes are not the same as God bringing good out of evil, but rather dark forces and dark characters saving the day. This is not how God works. I know of no saint who credits the devil, Caiaphas, Judas, or Pilate for putting Christ to death for our redemption. Thank you, devil. Without you, we couldn't have done it. No, Christ laid down his life willingly. In fact, he already basically fulfilled our redemption in the Last Supper through the separation of the body and the blood in the Mass. It was already done. It just needed to be materialized, as it were. The form put into matter on Good Friday on Calvary. Christ allowed them to put him to death so that he might bring the greatest good from it. He brought the good out, not them. No pagan, no naturalistic, humanistic, and least of all, occult force ever led Christ or his church in accomplishing good. Yet this is just what the Renaissance has led many to believe. This is a reversal. This is a disorientation of God's holy order. Now consider a few more points of contact between the occult and the works of Tolkien and Lewis. According to theosophy, the devil and his companion angels were really just solar angels. Those advanced beings who theosophy claimed descended thus the fall, from Venus to Earth, aeons ago, to bring the principle of mind, 
spark of intelligence, as it were, to what was then only animal man. They came to aid the evolutionary process along. In the theosophical perspective, the descent of these solar angels was not a fall into sin or disgrace, but rather an act of great sacrifice. As is suggested by the name Lucifer, which means light bearer. He had the spark of the mind that he gave to man. They came down to be with man and to help him evolve these solar angels. Not surprisingly, these occult followers pick and choose from Scripture passages as well as traditional works that they like to help them make their case. Now, turning to Tolkien. In the first section of his Silmarillion, the one God first created the Ionur, a group of eternal spirits or demiurges called the offspring of his thought. That's pure Gnosticism, folks. Offspring of his thought. After three attempts to sing the song of creation together with some singing not in harmony, the one God, Iluvatar, that he calls him, then stopped the music and showed them a vision of Arda, that would eventually become Middle-earth with all its peoples. The vision disappeared after a while, and Iluvatar offered the Ionar the chance to enter into Arda and govern over the world. Then Tolkien has many Ionur descending to take physical form and become bound to that world. The greater Ionor became known as the Valar, while the lesser Ionor were called Maiar. The Valar attempted to prepare the world for the coming inhabitants of elves and men. Well, Melkor, the one who didn't sing in harmony, one of the most powerful Ionor, who wanted Arda for himself, repeatedly destroyed their work. And this went on for thousands of years until through waves of destruction and creation, the world took shape. Each of the Ionor took up roles in certain places of Arda, according to Tolkien, the air, the seas, the earth, and under the earth, just as the pagan myths of old held. Can we not see here the great similarity with the occult doctrines? Higher powers descending, making a sacrifice, as it were, to be among men and elves in order to help them come into existence. It is significant that Tolkien has also identified them under male and female genders, which again the occult likes to do. As they like to give heavens and earth sexual identities and all their demiurges, genders. Of note also is how close this is to animism, which is the belief in his supernatural powers that organize and animate the parts of the material universe. Now, church doctrine tells us all this is erroneous. And to be rejected, we know for certain God created the universe and all its parts immediately. We've already talked about that. Immediately. No mediation. No demiurges. No angelic mediation. Also of notice how close these ideas are to the pagan myths. Tolkien has his Manwe, the Valar of the air, the greatest of the Valar, living and holding a court on top of the highest mountain of Arda. Ulmo and Larian and Aule and many others. Hello? Does not Olympus come to mind? <laughs> Is it not the same? What's the highest mountain in Greece? Olympus. Who held court on the top of that mountain? Zeus, Apollo, Athena, Poseidon, and others. That's where they lived and ruled. Hello, is this profoundly Christian? Rather, this comes from the occult stream that has been flowing out of the devil's mouth for centuries. 
Thus, we should not be surprised at how much the occult, the New Agers, and others love these books. Not surprisingly, Lewis has similar ideas presented in his Space Trilogy, wherein Dr. Ransom, who Lewis admits is really J.R.R. Tolkien, takes space flight to Venus and Mars. Like Tolkien, he too has certain spiritual powers to send from the higher realms to help take care of the worlds, calling them the Eldila. We could also recall that in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the Narnia series, there is the Island of the Star, where a fallen star, hello, a fallen star lives making reparation for some unnamed past misdeed. Now listen, fallen stars have always been considered first and foremost demons. Yikes! Is Lewis promoting universal salvation? That even the devil, a fallen star, the fallen star, will somehow be rehabilitated in the end? That is the constant theme in the occult. That is a constant theme in the occult. Sympathy for Satan. That they're not really the rebellious and evil angels those Catholics have made them out to be. Run! This is dangerous. On this same island, Lewis has magical powers flowing freely as the children experiment with books of spells sitting open in the library. Does this sound Catholic to anyone? A fallen star associated directly with a book of spells that really work? Dangerous times. Dangerous times. Not only that, Lewis goes on to recount how the fallen star has a daughter who ends up marrying the king. Also, when Aslan appeared to Lucy, he asks her if she liked his book of magic spells, the one that was in the library. In the Narnia tale, The Horse and His Boy, Lewis has the enemy turning into a donkey. But Aslan tells him that since he appealed to his god Tash, he will be healed in the temple of Tash next year. So much for the Catholic dogma of no salvation outside of Christ and his church. We can go to the god Tash now, and that's okay. Well, who does he represent? Muhammad. These are dangerous times. A few more points of contact. Now, when looking at the occult and those who give into it, one finds that they turn things upside down. Diabolical disorientation. For example, the church has traditionally held that hell, H-E double toothpicks, the home of the devils and place of eternal punishment, the lake of fire is where? Down! <laughs> down inside the earth and near it are purgatory and the limbo of the fathers when they were there. The occult turns that around. Suddenly we find down is good. There's no hell in the center of the earth. That's just some Catholic idea. There is much happiness down there after all, it seems. In, this, in the Narnia tale, the silver chair, for example, Lewis has some gnome-like creatures being enslaved by the wicked witch and brought up out of their own world deep down under the earth. They are miserable until they're released and allowed to descend back into their homes where they find complete happiness. I guess there's no hell in Narnia. Charles Manson was forever looking in Death Valley for a doorway into a magical city in the earth below. Hmm. Tolkien also gives some credence to this notion by showing the happiness of the dwarves and living below ground in huge underground cities and caves, and also in his desire to reinvigorate the Atlantis myth. Although there are many more things we could look into, there is one remaining issue that captures the whole 
of what I'm trying to say here today and exposes these myths for what they truly are, dangerous, very dangerous. Here I am thinking of the return of the ancient heresy of Gnosticism, which we've already briefly touched upon. Dr. Wolfgang Smith, in an article written for Homiletic and Pastoral Review, explains that although there are various strange sects of Gnostics hanging around today, what is amazing is that its main tenets have become mainstream in modern culture. I propose this has happened in part because of the rise of the occult, yes, and, and its accompanying fantasy literature that we're now discussing. Historically, Gnosticism is an ancient heresy, one of the earliest to attack the church. It's not always easy to pin down because it is like our modern New Age, picking and choosing things from all the systems of thought and belief at the time. It borrowed from Christianity, Persian religions, astrology, Jewish rabbinical and Talmudic ideas, fables of the Jews, one of our bookmarks, Egyptian myths and the Greek philosophy. Everything, everything it could find with individuals adding their own ideas as they went along. Thus, St. Irenaeus says, every day, every one of them invents something new. By the way, St. Irenaeus was the father after the scriptures were written, was the most successful in opposing Gnosticism. And that's what his works against heresies were about, fighting Gnosticism. Scholars have counted up to 30 different speculative systems among the Christian Jewish Gnostics. So in a word, Quaston tells us ancient Gnosticism is a mixture of Oriental religions and Greek philosophy. From the Oriental religions, Gnosticism separated God from his creation, the spiritual from the material, heaven from earth, soul from body, with the spiritual longing for liberation from the material. From Greek philosophy, Gnosticism picked up its speculative elements, says Quaston. Thus, the speculations concerning various mediators between God and the world were introduced from Neoplatonism a naturalistic kind of mysticism from Neo-Pythagoreanism, and the appreciation of the individual and his ethical task from Neo-Stoicism. So says Quaston. Don't worry about the Pythagoreanism, Platonism, and Stoicism so much. Just recognize that these are the elements that an expert on Gnosticism is telling us that they possessed. And they came from Greek philosophy. Now, reflecting on these ancient forms of Gnosticism, Dr. Smith explains that it has indeed returned and displayed three main doctrinal characteristics. Number one, the Gnostic devaluation of the cosmos. Number two, liberation through some form of mystic flight. Mystic flight. Number three, the need of special knowledge, Gnosis, to carry out this flight. Okay, with these we can see how Tolkien's myth is very much in keeping with Gnosticism, as well as how this old heresy has returned in this moment of history. Let's spend the rest of our time looking into these three factors to see how this is true. We're living in a time when pseudoscience has risen to power, forcing itself upon us. It seems nearly every scientist today must promote the various pseudosystems that are steadily being proved wrong, by the way, if that scientist is to keep his job, they will be expelled if they do not promote the company line. Copernicanism, Einstein's relativity, Darwinism, Big Bang cosmology, and so on. 
This pattern is most clearly seen with Darwinian evolution, which is nothing but an ideological postulate masquerading in scientific garb. It is a philosophy, not science. It is of belief, not observation. In any case, all of these systems, taken alone or taken together, lead to a rather dim view of our cosmos. We have been falsely taught from childhood how we are completely accidental, not special. Coming from a speck that blew up, all is relative, yuck. Who wants to grow up in such a meaningless place? Then we're told how we came to be hmm, from another speck. We, we became alive and living from this one speck, a single cell amoeba. And after ages and ages of painful mutations, death and disease, we humans finally arrived on the scene. Yuck! Who takes delight in being part of such a process of death and decay and mutation? Can we not see here the devaluation of God's cosmos? This devaluation is also present in Tolkien's myth in that Melkor is allowed to sow his seeds of disharmony and wreck the world. Tolkien explains in the Silmarillion how Melkor, who wanted Arda for himself, repeatedly destroyed the work of the good Valar. And this went on for thousands of years through waves of destruction and creation until finally Middle-earth took shape. Does this sound like God's creation that was perfect at the start? Perfect! All through the Lord of the Rings, there's a certain sense of doom hanging over the book. How Rivendell and Lothlorien are the only places of safe harbor left, and even they are fading. Recall how even after the one evil ring is finally destroyed, these places continue to fade. And all the trouble Frodo went through and experienced could not be overcome as long as he remained in Middle Earth, no matter how hard he tried. His sleep was constantly disturbed. What is the logical conclusion of this devaluation of the cosmos? Take flight. Since man is stuck in this world, stuck with the status quo or the material reality we have to deal with, the only way out is a mystic journey. Have you ever read this short story, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty? He is frustrated with his miserable life and overburdened marriage, and off he goes on some incredible mystic flights of heroism. But there is more here than just escapism, because this is also tied in with the occult. The devil wants to help you out. He wants to help you have that mystic flight. Here's some examples. 39 members of a New Age group called Heaven's Gate committed mass suicide on March 26, 1997, believing according to the teachings of their cult that through their suicides, they were, quote, exiting their human vessels, end quote, so that their souls could go on a journey aboard a spaceship they believed to be following Comet Haley Bob. They wanted to exit their bodies. Material reality was too much to bear. Take flight. Mystic flight. From 1994 to 1997, the members of the Order of the Solar Temple began a series of mass suicides which led to something like 74 deaths. Farewell letters were left by members stating that they believed their deaths would be an escape from the hypocrisies and oppressions of this world. They believed by their suicide they were moving on to the star Sirius. Mystic flight. We know Jim Jones took a thousand people 
in such a flight, escaping the capitalists and oppressors. Revolutionary suicide, and they would meet again in another place, he promised them. Today we have the rapture being very popular among the Protestants. We're going to rapture out of this situation. Mystic flight. I remember listening to NPR when I was attending college back in the 1980s. One of the, the times I listened to this, there was a man from California who was interviewed who claimed he could produce lucid dreams and enter into them. Mystic flight. Many others on the NPR program at that time, I remember, spoke of their out-of-body experiences, mystic flight. Although Tolkien rightly deplores suicide as a form of mystic flight, as is clearly seen in his character Denethor, he nevertheless presents this element of modern Gnosticism. In The Lord of the Rings, Frodo, Elrond, Galadriel, Gandalf, and others all had to take flight from the world like so many before them. They had to leave Middle-earth and find peace someplace in the West over the seas. They could not conquer but fled. Notice, by the way, the direction they went, West. The opposite of what Catholics have always considered the holy direction. Anton LaVey, in his directions on setting up altars for satanic worship, directed that they should always face west, not east. Clearly, these books capture what is going on in the world at this present moment, rather than God's holy and timeless truths. That's one of the purposes of myth, to capture popular ideas and to support them and to promote them. Instead of showing the errors of our times, these myths go along with the errors. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder they're so popular. Finally, the third element of Gnosis or special knowledge indicates how the mystic flight is actually accomplished. Think of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. All she needed was the knowledge of how to use the silver slippers. And off she went back home to Kansas. In the book, there was silver, not ruby. The New Age groups of Heaven's Gate and the Order of Solar Templar believed to have special knowledge that if they committed suicide in a certain way together on a certain date, they would be taken on a spaceship away from this world. Hmm. If you looked into the supposed Marian apparitions of Mary Ann Van Hoof, which occurred in Nacida, Wisconsin, back in the 1950s, you will find these amazing elements. We must sign up for a spaceship coming to take us away before the coming chastisement. According to the messages, this spaceship will take the faithful to, of all places, Middle Earth. <laughs> Middle Earth where they will be spared the chastisement and then emerge to repopulate the world and establish Christ's true church. See how all this stuff goes together. This is a condemned apparition. Dr. Smith carefully notes that what makes this knowledge Gnostic is that it is a claim to something one does not really have. Those poor, deluded people did not get on any spaceship this is all lies, error, heresy, tricks of the devil. It is no secret that there is all kinds of special knowledge in and around the Tolkien myth. Elrond and Gandalf and other enlightened ones are always speaking of esoteric things, having secret knowledge, secret and hidden rings on their fingers, secret fires, and so on. And this knowledge is what enables them to do their difficult tasks and in the end to take their final mystic journey into the West, leaving behind troubled Middle-earth. 
Even the advertising of Joseph Pierce's lectures on the Lord of the Rings smells of this element of Gnosticism. Quote, in this fascinating and insightful course, Joseph Pierce highlights theological significance encoded, encoded in the characters, objects, and places of Middle Earth, unlocking the secrets of the most popular work of the 20th century and the life of its author, J.R.R. Tolkien. In quote, encoded, unlocking secrets. I thought this myth was supposed to be a purveyor of transcendental truth. Why is it secret? Why does it need to be uncoded? Recall how Quaston described Gnosticism, a mixture of Oriental religion with Greek philosophy. From the Oriental religions, Gnosticism, he says, separated God from his creation. Okay, let's look at the Tolkien series. Where is God in the works of the Lord of the Rings? He is not mentioned. Theology always has God as its object. How can the Lord of the Rings be a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, a theological thriller, when God is separated from the work? Seems to look a little Gnostic there. Quaston goes on. From Greek philosophy, Gnosticism picks up its speculative elements. Thus, the speculations concerning mediators between God and the world were introduced from Neoplatonism, Quaston. We have seen this in how the one god of Tolkien's myth used the Valar to help him create Arda and manage it. Quaston. Gnosticism has a naturalistic kind of mysticism from Neopythagoreanism. All the mysticism in Tolkien's myth is natural. It does not mention God. It does not mention holiness. It does not mention grace, faith, hope, charity. Quaston. Gnosticism provides the appreciation of the individual and his ethical task from Neo-Stoicism. Much is made of the virtues of the hobbits and Aragon, Gandalf and so on by Mr. Pierce. Yet all of their actions are of a natural virtue. Nothing supernatural here. Again, no faith, no hope or charity is mentioned. No wonder, no wonder Frodo was overcome by the ring. He did not have any supernatural help from within. Only the evil Gollum could help him from without. I propose to you that these works are truly neo-Gnostic, even to the very core, and are not safe to read. They are well-liked, not only because, as fantasy, they provide a sort of mystic flight in these times that are trying and troubling, but also because many today so easily identify with the story and what has become a very Gnostic moment in the world. We're swimming in it. I would like to end this conference with a, an appeal to use our holy faith. We do not need to be looking outside of our holy church and true religion for things to captivate our imagination and encourage us. In the lives of the saints, we find more wonders than can be grasped in a lifetime. We find saints flying up to heaven in true mystical flights of God, whether it be in a fiery chariot of St. Elias or the levitations of St. Joseph Copertino or the raptures of St. Teresa of Jesus. We have saints like Lydwin of Shidem falling down on the ice at 15 only to lie on her bed, never to rise again, paralyzed for 38 years, not eating, sleeping, or drinking hardly anything. Suffering every disease known except leprosy, all without dying. Yet her angel comes, and off they go on some mystical journey to a church in Christendom, to purgatory, or to Eden, 
to talk to some saint. St. Anthony of the desert confronted the devil for years with incredible and intense stories to tell. Saints lived on the top of columns, walled themselves up in holes of the earth to do battle with the devil. Fierce combat. A monk falling from the wall in the building of a monastery hangs in midair while St. Vincent Ferrer goes and asks permission to save his life. This is good stuff, folks. Wrap your imagination around some of these. This is real. A teenage girl leads hardened men in historic battles to become the world's greatest general. She gets them to stop blaspheming. She gets them to go to communion, and daily mass, and confession. The crippled, blinded, hunchback, blessed Margaret of Costello is walled up in a church sacristy most of her life and yet is so filled with joy that she is able to levitate, heal diseases, and put out fires. We have saints like John Vianney living only on potatoes, not able to sleep because the devil plays a sort of band music all night long while marching through the house. And yet he's able to see into souls in purgatory too. Spending 15 hours on average in the confessional, wrap your imagination around that. And what of blessed Anna Maria Taigi, who could really see events of times, present and future, in a ball of light given her by God. She saw her times and she wept. The dangers we're in. A ball of fire descended from heaven into the heart of St. Philip, nearly breaking three of his ribs, and he was on fire with the love of God ever since. Wrap your imagination around these things. They're real. These are only a handful of the wonders found in the lives of the saints. By reading and studying them, we're not making any claim on knowledge we do not have, but rather what has been given to us. We are listening to our King, the beloved Son of the Father, through His saints. With this true knowledge from God, this true word, our faith, our hope, our charity are greatly strengthened. And maybe this is why so few, <laughs> why so few go this path. When reading the lives of the saints, there is grace present. There's always a grace available when you're reading the life of a saint. Uh, this is why Edith Stein converted in reading the life of St. Teresa of Jesus. Because we're confronted with outstanding examples of holiness, of Christian holiness, of Catholic holiness, of people who are real and are still available to us even now. They live on in heaven. People who sought to make their own lives an incarnation of the one Word of God instead of their own Word. They no longer wanted to live, but wanted Christ to live in them. They didn't want to make a new Word made flesh. They wanted the one Word to be made flesh through them again. Through these saints, we see how the gospel is lived in time and space. And that means we are not free to make of their lives what we want, as so many do with the fantasy literature. Huh, no wonder why few read them. They're afraid. Oh my goodness, I've got to do that too, somehow. Instead, we are shamed when we read these lives. We're shamed in our pettiness, in our pusillanimity littleness of soul, seeing ever more the need to detach from all that is worldly, all that is of the flesh, all that is of the devil. We're confronted with the need for conversion in our whole life, not in just what we find applicable. Yikes! 
Not so with the Lord of the Rings and other myths, not so, for they do not promote the gospel, but rather are productions of an extravagant imagination, of strange and occult words, thereby allowing the reader to freely pick and choose from these heresy-ridden fantasies what they like and to reject the rest. In such works, not being of the word of God made flesh, there is no compelling grace to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. And this is why a hundred and fifty million can read these myths and not worry about becoming Catholic. Let us break free of these chains and walk free in the open light of God and no longer be numbered among those in the cave. O faithful of Christ, keep that which is committed to thy trust, Christ, the true word of God, our holy Catholic faith, avoiding the profane novelties of words, of myths, fantasies, and oppositions of knowledge falsely so called of Gnosticism. Viva Christo Rey! In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.